Do you want me to? Okay. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, all right. Go ahead and get your reading questions out. We're going to flip flop today. We're going to start with our reading questions, and then we're going to talk about Julius Caesar, the play, and then we're going to flip flop back to our questions a little bit. Um, your reading questions are on page 53. Oh, before we do that, okay, guys, we need to stop having conversations now, except with me or about our topic. And you want to stop having conversation because of what I have to show you. These are Roman coins. They're actual Roman coins. They're 1,700 years old. Yeah. No. I did not buy them. I did not steal them. <laughs> My son bought them for me for Christmas. Um, what? I don't. I, you know what? They're not. They're not worth that much because they're not real good quality. But here's the deal. If you will be nice to them, I'm going to pass it around. And I don't care if you reach in and and like take it and and check it out. Okay. But please don't take them. They're a Christmas gift from my son. And don't just drop the bag or flip the bag upside down. Because then we're going to be crawling around looking for OK? Right? You're old enough. Like the little kids, I wouldn't do this with. Um, so you can see when you take them out, they're really very worn. And this is why these are not museum rep quality you know, uh, exhibits. These are just the average. You know, They find Roman coins all over Europe all the time. It's, it's, it's a dime a dozen. In fact, I have a boy from my other class that I teach this class on Tuesdays, and he bought some for himself, and he said they cost him like a few bucks. Like he just, just a, a few, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't expensive. Now, I don't know, I'm not an expert on coins at all, but I got a book from the library on um, Roman coins and identifying Roman coins. And unfortunately, I mean, my eyes aren't very good anymore, but even with my reading glasses and the magnifying glass, I could see some, and I see, and your eyes, being young, you may be able to see much more than me. Um, I see these letters um, and, or, or on some of them. So I know these fall under, under an emperor, but there are emperors, Constantine and his sons, Constans, Constantius, and Constantine II, and I don't know. Okay, well, we'll say that. Um, and then on the back, there are various, just like we have heads and tails, you know, they do too. So in the front would be an image of the emperor and his name and everything. On the back would be, sometimes it's goddesses. Sometimes this one has two figures. Um, and I wasn't sure what they were, but there's symbols on the bottom of the, of the tails. And they're code for where it was minted. And I, I found the minted code for Carthage on one of them. I know, it's cool. So anyway, be be nice to my Christmas gift. But yeah, if you want to check them out, I don't mind. Are they all the same? They're not all the same. They're all different. But uh, but yeah, they're you, you can see the edges are really, really worn. And they're thin. They're so thin. <laughs> no. That is such a good question. I think... They're, they did have silver coins, bronze, or copper, I think. Um, not silver for very long. And, and just like we do, did we talk about debasing the currency? OK. Yeah, so when you take, when you take coins that are silver, you know, so they're worth money because they're silver, but then they're not silver anymore. They're just coated with silver, and they're lead inside. So we still say, this is worth a dime, but it's not really worth anything because it's just a piece of lead. Um, but yeah, so these aren't really good enough to go in a museum. I feel like this is now going to take longer than I realized, and I'm not really going to be able to say anything while they're doing it, which is okay. Oh, you know what we're going to do? Okay, how many of them are there? One, two, as long as we collect them all back. The letters are too long, I can't reach them. One, two. Oh, here. Here, if you oh, want to check one out. Three, four, five. Six, seven. Oh, there's one for everybody. Eight, and there's one left over. Okay, so everybody, everybody can look at one. How about that? Yes. I do not know where they were found. Uh, in Britain, they still find all sorts of Roman stuff in Britain. 
people are building houses sometimes in Britain and they just run into stashes of Roman stuff. And they, yes, I saw this. I saw this. This should have happened at the end. Sorry, people watching. Yes, and mosaics. Yes. Oh, no, you you know what? You told me about this. You told me about this. I saw something else online, though. It was, it was a mosaic. It was a mosaic floor. All right, we won't make this last forever. All right, I'm going to come around and collect the coins. Well, I know, but you know what? I'm going to I'm going to just put them over there by the wall on the floor. And if we get done early, you can just go open the bag and they they're not very different from each other. It's all right. It's all right. So, if you want to, I'm putting it over here by my purse in the corner. Like, I don't I don't care. You can go over there and check it out after class. We'll see if we get done a little early. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right. Yeah, the, it does smell. Okay. <laughs> Julius Caesar came back to Rome, crossed the Rubicon River, said, I've rolled the dice, I'm doing it, and everybody skedaddled. Okay, we're going to let me talk now. There will be time for you to talk. There will be plenty of time. Um, and he came into Rome and people remembered a time when a leader had marched into Rome with his army before, Sulla. What did Sulla do when he came home? And did what when he got there? Yeah, he just massively killed people. He posted lists of people who needed to die on the wall every day. So everybody knew Julius Caesar was coming and they were in a panic, right? What is he going to do? What did he do? He, he didn't do anything to anyone. As a matter of fact, Dorothy Mills tells us that this is one of the things that happened. Caesar was told that one of his old officers, one who had been a trusted friend and who had fought with him through the Gallic War, had deserted him and gone over to Pompey. All Caesar did was send his money and belongings after him and he showed the same moderation and clemency to everyone. Yeah. I don't know anything. I don't pay any attention to current events, so I have no idea what's going on in South Africa. But yes, it it was horrifying. It was horrifying, and this happened maybe m maybe thirty years ago with Sulla. You know, it, it, short enough time ago that people remember. And Julius Caesar came and he's like, "Oh, that's that's a shame. They went with Pompey. Well, take him his stuff." Yes. Um, but the problem is there's an army against him in Greece, Pompey's army. And when Pompey left, he took pretty much the whole Senate with him. He took Cicero, the great speaker, with him. He took Brutus and Cassius with him. And, and he, 
he's got to do, they've got to do something about this. They can't just live like this indefinitely, you know, with Caesar in Rome and Pompey in Greece and something's going to happen. So what, what Caesar did is, first of all, he settled things in Rome. And okay, this is my map, of the world that faces you. Okay. And, and he's in Italy. And then he went to Spain because there were some allies of Pompey in Spain and Pompey's in Greece. Before he heads this way, he doesn't want enemies behind him. You don't want enemies behind you. So go deal with them. There's nobody behind them because it's the Atlantic Ocean. So deal with them, then come back to Italy. So now I'm going to, to head to Greece. And um, this army had been with him. His army had been with him for you know 10 years in Gaul. And they loved him, but they were getting a little tired, quite frankly. They're getting, the years were catching up with them. They were getting old and tired. So they're marching to the coast in Italy, and Caesar got on a boat, and he went ahead to Greece because he didn't want to wait for everybody. And they were marching. They were grumbling the whole time. Oh, he's so tough on us. Doesn't he understand that we've been fighting for a decade for this guy, and we just want a break? He just acts like we're robots and not men. And then they got to the coast, and they found out he'd already left. He left us. We deserted our general. And they just had a meltdown. They loved him so much. And they were, they were on again. They were ready to fight. They went across. Caesar was waiting for more reinforcements. Mark Antony, who you met in the play, had these reinforcements. And he wasn't coming, and he wasn't coming, mostly because the wind was... In the ancient world, you waited for good wind. They didn't really sail against the wind. You know, we have, we can tack back and forth against the wind. They didn't do that. They just waited for the wind to be in the right direction. He was waiting. And Caesar thought, what is up with Mark Antony? So he muffles himself up in a cloak. It's Julius Caesar. Muffles himself up in a cloak and goes down and finds a fishing boat. Tells the fisherman, hey, will you take me over to Italy? It's not that far from Greece to Italy. Like, eh, well... It's not very good weather, but look, here's some money. I'll pay it. All right. He doesn't know who it is. The fisherman doesn't know who it is. And they start across. And it's, it's blowing. It's blowing. It's blowing the ship back. And he says, okay, buddy, I'm sorry. I, I'd love to get you to Italy, but we're going to have to turn back because it's not going to happen. Caesar stands up and he throws off his cloak. And he says, do not fear, for you have the fate of Caesar in your boat which is a lovely story, but they still didn't get across. <laughs> uh, he's, he's Caesar. He's not Jesus. He doesn't, you know, say peace be still to the storm. Didn't happen. So they went back to Greece, but eventually they got everybody across. And at the first, at the first battle, Caesar lost. Pompey had more, more men and Caesar lost. But then Pompey just withdraws. He, he, he doesn't finish him off. And Caesar said, you know what? The day would have been our enemies if he'd known how to use his victory, if they'd had a general who knew how to use a victory. Do you remember somebody else that got said about? We talked about him since this semester, since Christmas, since January. Someone else who won a great victory, didn't follow up, and somebody, what? It wasn't Sulla. Longer ago than that. He obliterated the Romans, that can I? And then didn't do anything. Like, yeah, I'm kind of tired. Let's just have some lunch and count our loot. What? And his brother said, Hannibal, you know how to win a victory. You, you, you just don't know how to use it, do ya? You see how much? OK, this is what fascinates me about history, guys. That, so, uh, historians now, they're really into studying, oh, the place of women and children, and I, I don't care. I, I, it's those pivotal people. Pompey made a decision, and it changed the history of the world. Hannibal made a decision, and it changed the history of the world. And every once in a while, these light bulbs go off in history. It's like, buddy, if you had, if you had done differently, Pompey would have been the leader of Rome. The Carthaginians would have taken over Rome if, if you just had been a slightly different sort of person or felt a little less lazy that day. I don't know. So Pompey regroups, and Caesar follows him. 
And Pompey's got a camp full of people who are kind of teasing him a little bit, uh, peer pressuring it. All right? Don't you want to fight Caesar? I want to just get this over with? Well, maybe. Maybe you just like having us all at your beck and call in your army camp. Maybe you don't want to bring this to a conclusion, Pompey. One guy complained, well, I guess we can, we can decide there will be no gathering of figs in Tusculum this year, which means there's no way we're getting home to Italy when the fig crop comes in. And I thought I was going to be home eating my figs, drinking my drink with the little umbrella in it, and having a great time. No, we're stuck in Greece because Pompey won't fight. You see, and so if you listen to that sort of thing long enough, right? If you're Pompey, like, shoot, I better, I better fight. The night before the big battle, apparently, they're lounging around in their tents, divvying up offices in Rome. Pompey's army is. Oh, uh, who wants to be consul when we get back? Yeah, you want to be proconsul? Yeah, ideal, praetor? Yeah, I'll take that. They're divvying it up because we got this. They didn't, they didn't have it. <laughs> this was outside the city of Pharsalia, and it was one of the world-changing battles because Julius Caesar won, and he did know how to use a victory. Pompey looked around, like, what, what, yeah, what, what, what is going on? And he goes into the camp, and he just sits down in his tent. And then he hears guys rummaging through the tents, the Caesar's guys, and he says, what? Are they in the camp too? Yeah. And so he just wanders off by himself and finds a boat and leaves by himself. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. When Caesar's army came in, very good. When Caesar's army came in, they had, <clears throat> oh, do you remember, this is all the way last semester now, when the Persians attacked Greece, and, and that final battle where Pausanias, the Spartan general, killed, killed the uh, Mardonius, the Persian general, and went into the Persian camp, and it was all full of silks and satins and gold dishes. And, and he said, who goes on an army campaign like this? That's how Pompey's guys were going on campaign, because they thought it was a cinch. And it wasn't. So Pompey gets in a boat, goes to collect his wife, who's been put on one of the Greek islands for safekeeping. Where shall we go? I don't know. Let's go to Egypt. Bad idea. Bad idea. They head towards Egypt, and the king of Egypt is Ptolemy. He's a kid. No offense to kids, but sometimes when the kid is king, grown-ups tell them what to do. <laughs> the kid doesn't really make decisions. This was the case in Egypt. And so Ptolemy, Ptolemy's advisors said, eh, it looks like Pompey, oh crud, what do we do? Well, if we welcome him, Caesar will be mad at us. And if, we, if Caesar wins, if we send him away, Pompey will be mad at us, if Pompey wins eventually. And Caesar will be mad at us for letting him get away if Caesar wins. Let's just kill him. That solves everything. So they go out to meet his boat in a little, a little boat. Hey, Pompey. And, and, and it's Pompey the Great. It's Pompey the Great. But they come in just this little podunk boat, just some scruffy riffraff looking guys. And this seems suspicious. It's Pompey the Great. You send out your, your high officials, right? You're important people, and they did it. His wife says, don't. You don't want to get in that boat. At this point, I don't know if he trusted them. I don't know if he just felt like, I don't care anymore. It's done. And he gets in the boat. They don't even make it to the shore. They kill him, take his head, throw his body on the beach, left to be buried by a random guy and an old soldier of his who wanders up the beach and sees him. What? They got away. The, the, it, the Pompey got in the boat and went with them, and they, as soon as they saw what happened, they didn't stick around because maybe they'll be after us next. When Caesar came to Egypt, 
How do you remember how he reacted um, when he found out they'd killed Pompey? Yeah, yeah, he was sad. He was, he was horrified. Oh, he 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 said, "You you've deprived me of the chance to forgive him." But why did you do this? Caesar said this a lot. I don't know if he meant it. This is a mystery of history. I don't know if he just talked nice so people would like him. It's easy to say you wanted to forgive someone after they're dead. This is a very easy thing to say. But he said it more than once after people were dead. And he did forgive the people who were alive, so I don't know. While he was in the East, he figures he might as well take care of some business over there. So first up, this Ptolemy kid king, he can't get along with his sister. Can you imagine? He can't get along with his siblings. His sister was Cleopatra. And Cleopatra decided, I would love to be queen of Egypt, but I'd like to be even more than that, like queen of Rome. That'd be awesome. This Caesar guy can get me there. So she hooks up with Julius Caesar. They say... He was not seeing visitors. And so she had herself rolled up in a throw rug, like a Persian rug. And they carried it, and they unrolled it. And it was just like Cleopatra looking pretty on the rug, you know? So he hung out with her for a while, long enough to have a child with Cleopatra. Um, <laughs> Caesarian. And you want to guess how he had to be born? Do you know what a cesarean is? Oh, OK. Um, it's science day. Mrs. Ferguson said, um, sometimes women have to have babies surgically removed. That's what the C stands for, cesarean. OK, you do know. Um, that's why it's called that, cesarean. Cleopatra and Caesar's son, cesarean, to be born that way. Um, OK, so he's in the East. Unfortunately, sets fire to the Library of Alexandria. Just a little bit. <laughs> Doesn't burn at all. It's going to be the Muslims that come and completely obliterate it later. It had several torchings, but this was the first loss at the library. And while I'm over here, I might as well go whoop up on the Parthians who are always causing trouble. So he does. Sends a message back to Rome. How's it going, Caesar? His message is three words in Latin. You know them, I bet. Waney, Weedy, Weechi. I came, I saw, I conquered. That's his whole military report. I came, I saw, I conquered. So he heads back. Oh, while he's in Africa, he also has to go along the African coast chasing Cato, the senator who has more rebel forces, shall we say. And... Uh, he also kills himself and is one of those, oh, he has deprived me of the chance to forgive him. And then he goes and fights Pompey's sons in Spain. And everything is done. He goes back to Rome and is, somebody mentioned it, dictator for life. Dictator for life. Now, what were dictators for? When did, when did the Romans have a dictator? Yeah, Jesse. For emergencies, for how long? Six months. Not for life. And there's no emergency now, right? There's no emergency. But he's dictator for life. What is, some, what is another name for a dictator for life? Yeah, king. He's basically a king. But you know... 400 years before, almost 500 years before, they threw out their last king and set up a republic. And they made a law, no one can call himself king. No one can become king in Rome. In fact, there's a couple of episodes during the early republic where they just thought somebody was setting himself up for king and they executed him. We don't have kings. Now, let's, I, and I, I'm sorry, I've blown through the questions. Who fought at the Battle of Pharsalia? Obviously, Pompey and Caesar. Who won? Obviously, Caesar. These were very easy questions. Um, let's switch gears because this is where the play opens. This is the moment when the play opens. 
Now, did you all, were you all able to find my video if you wanted to? Okay. You already read the whole thing? Oh, just Acts 1 through 3. Okay. Um, if, if somebody had a problem, let me know. And if you didn't want to watch, you're not obligated to. I just thought it would be helpful. Um, Caesar, when the play opens, uh, they're having a holiday, and people are decorating statues of Caesar. And these tribunes come up and they say, what's up? Don't you remember Pompey? He was Pompey the Great. You loved him once. You crowded the streets. Remember Dorothy Mills tells us that when, when he came home from the East, he laid down his army, but there were so many crowds following them that he could have taken over if he wanted to just from the crowds following him. You loved him. And, and now you're decorating the statues of Caesar who, let, who killed him, didn't kill him, but, you know, was involved, okay, in the circumstances that led to his death. It, what, why would you do this? Yeah, Rhett. I know. I don't, I don't understand what happens. Although I will tell you a secret. My husband is my a subscriber and my brother. My brother said sometimes he just turns things on and listens to me talk. This apartment. I don't know if he really listens to what I'm saying. And my daughter. So I, random people may just, <laughs> random family members of mine may be listening to me. Yes, yeah, so, and I want to talk about that more. Yes, the crowd is, Shakespeare is not very complimentary to this crowd. They're very fickle. Now, um, I don't know where you started your little should Brutus have killed Caesar list, but we're going to be adding, I'm going to be writing on the board. So add to, also chime in. I'd like to go around and find out what some of you decided. Um, uh, but um, so as we, as we go through the play, I'd like to be working on this. Uh, so there's a scene where um, it, it, it's a Lupercalia. It's a, it's a festival. And Brutus and Cassius are both there. Now, remember what I told you. Brutus and Cassius had gone over to Pompey's side. And Caesar had not only forgiven them, but given them jobs. And so I, personally, you probably wrote this down, but I am... Should Brutus kill Caesar? No. Caesar forgave him. Do I have to say for joining Pompey or does Caesar forgave him enough? Okay. Um, and Caesar, do you know what, what I mean when I do the two little dot things like this? It means the same word again. Caesar gave him a, 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 an, an office, a position. Not like an office building, you know, a position. So one would think that you would be grateful, right, for someone to do this for you. But Cassius takes him aside. What kind of guy is Cassius? How does he strike you? He's very conniving. Somebody yesterday called him a weasel. <laughs> I liked it. He's, he's weaselly. He's kind of slimy, just a little bit. And, and so um, he takes Brutus aside during this, this festival, and they have a little discussion. And, and he starts making hints. He says this. It is very much lamented, Brutus, that you have no mirrors as will turn your hidden worthiness into your own eye. It's too bad you can't see yourself as others see you, Brutus, so we can see how very honorable you are, that you might see your shadow. I have heard where many of the best respect in Rome, except immortal Caesar, speaking of Brutus and groaning underneath this age's yoke, have wished that noble Brutus had his eyes. 
you know, the talk is, Brutus, the people wished you saw what was going on here. Brutus isn't stupid. Brutus doesn't need too many hints. And he says this, into what dangers you would, would you lead me, Cassius, that you would have me seek into myself for that which is not in me? He immediately jumps to the conclusion, Cassius is leading me on to do something dangerous, risky. And I think I, I think I know what it is. Cassius goes on and he says, uh, for myself, Cassius says, I had as lief not be as live to be in awe of such a thing as I myself. I'd rather be dead than bow down to another creature that's the same as me. And then he tells that story. You know, once upon a time we were swimming. We were swimming and the tiger, it was cold. And you're like, you want to do it? Yeah. And they both jumped in and Caesar's halfway across and he gets cold. Help me, Cassius. Help me, I'm drowning. I bet Cassius says it just like that too. And then once he says, I was in an army camp with him and he got a fever, he got sick. He he whined like a little girl for a drink. And this guy's in charge of the world? What? Uh, he probably has. And you know what? I, I, sense, I sense a little bit of jealousy. Why does he get everything? He, he says this. I, I love this. He doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus. You know, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was this huge statue at the Colossus of Rhodes. And, and it's huge. I mean, it, I don't know how tall the Colossus was. It's not there anymore. But picture a statue that's like 50, 60, 70, 80 feet tall. All right. And he says he bestrides the world like a colossus. And he says, and all the people are just like little ants running around under his feet. That's what Caesar's like. But for no good reason, because he says this. Men at some time are masters of their fates. You might say, well, fate. Fate made Caesar the ruler and you not, Cassius. He says this, though. The fault, dear Brutus is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Well, he's saying yes, if he doesn't act. But he has a choice, doesn't he? He could, if he wants it, if he wants to change his fate, if he wants to change the future. It's not written in the stars. No astrologer is going to tell me what I'm going to turn into. I'll grab a sword and do it for myself. But he doesn't say, you know, he's not saying that. He's not speaking so plainly. Brutus is not so sure. Brutus is not so sure that he wants to hear more. In fact, he says, Cassius, I think I know what you're hinting at. I'll talk to you later. Um, all right. And there's a line. What you would work me to, I have some aim. How I have thought of this and of these times, I shall recount hereafter. Brutus has been thinking these same things already. Caesar's too powerful. Maybe not the same way as Cassius. Maybe not, I'm jealous, you know, and I want to take charge of my fate. Caesar's too powerful. He's been thinking it over. And he's been thinking about his family legacy, right? His ancestors drove out the kings. So one might argue he has a family obligation to guard Rome, right? Uh, I mean, from his, from his perspective. I've been thinking about this already. This man is too much power, too much. Well, uh, they want to know what happened because they hear shouts. You remember this? They hear yelling and shouts while they're talking. And Casca, a friend of theirs, comes by and they say, grab Casca, find out what happened. And Casca said, oh, you wouldn't believe it. Mark Antony was there, offered Caesar a crown. And Caesar just waved his aside. No, no. 
And the crowd went wild. Yay, Caesar doesn't want a crown. But Casca says, you know what I thought? I thought he was a little ticked off that the crowd didn't want him to have the crown. He wanted the crowd to yell, take it, Caesar, take it. Mark Antony offers it again. Waves it by, and the crowd cheers. He says, but Caesar didn't look very happy. Mark Antony offers it a third time, and he casts aside, and then he, ends up, he passes out. Caesar just passes out. I, yes, uh, I said this on the video. Tis very like, he hath the falling sickness, epilepsy. And Cassius says the greatest line, no, Caesar hath it not, but you and I and honest Casca, we have the falling sickness. We are just falling down under this guy's feet. He doesn't mean we're literally falling. But we're all eclipsed by the power of Caesar. We have the falling sickness. It's not Caesar. So they offered Caesar a crown, but he wouldn't take it. Which side would this argue for? No, no, he, he refused the crown. However, he has, Caesar has much power. He is dictator for life. But he did refuse the crown. Uh, um, he seemed to want the crown. What? Yeah, yeah, and, and really he is, I'm going to put it with this, he's basically king. Already. So Cassius has a dirty low plan. How is he going to work on Brutus? Do you remember? He tells people, write letters to Brutus and say things like, oh, Brutus, great Brutus, have you forgotten your family history? And don't you want to save Rome? Oh, Rome is crying out to you as her savior. And just leave these letters where he'll find them. It's very sneaky. So he thinks all of Rome wants him to do something. Mm. There was only the one. Yeah. We only witnessed one of them, but Cassius tells his compatriots, go you and put them in the various places where he will find them. So that's all we know. So we just we just extrapolate from that. Okay, he's finding one. And I think actually, okay, bear with me. I didn't mark my places, but I'd be able to find it pretty fast. Um, it's when they are in his, it's after they leave him in his, Oh, I could almost swear. No, that's too far. Oh, oh, yes, yes. I, I, I thought, okay, this seems familiar, but I'm not, I, like, with the letters? Okay, I'm sorry. I am looking for it, and I thought it was after this meeting but maybe it's not. And uh, he, anyway, when his servant says, oh, what's this letter doing here? You know, and he reads it. He says something to the effect of, I've been finding lots of these sorts of things lately. Okay. Uh, I think so. But I can't find the place where he finds that letter. Portia. Yes and no. But 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 it's it's before she. I thought he finds that letter before. Okay, you know what? Don't worry. It's not important enough for us to spend. Oh oh, I found it. I found it. It's in scene one. It's before they come to visit him. All right, act one, act two, scene one. It's page nineteen in this Dover edition. Okay, such yeah. He reads the letter and then says such instigations have been often dropped where I have took them up. 
All right, so this has been happening. Um, okay, so uh, they, they decide to, to get together with Brutus and suck him in a little further, the whole band of conspirators. You know, when guys show up at your house in the middle of the night and they won't show their faces, this is never a good sign. His wife, Portia, knows this is not a good sign. Who were these guys? What are they doing up in the middle of the night all muffled and cloaked? They're a nasty lot. Bruce like, don't worry about it. I got it under control. And, and so they decide that Caesar is going to die. It must be by his death, says Brutus. It must be by his death. And he said, it's too bad. It's really the spirit of Caesar, you know, the spirit of kingship and dictatorship we want. If I could get at his spirit without hacking his body open, that'd be awesome. But unfortunately, can't. So we're going to have to do it. So Brutus says, I'm in. I'm in. And then I mentioned this on the video. Did you notice? First of all, while he's talking to Cassius, three of the conspirators can't even decide where the East is. And yeah. Yeah, everything, they can't make a decision about anything. And Brutus comes in and instantly is like, no, nah, don't do that. No, nah, don't do that. And, okay, so you've read through Act 3. You know what Mark Antony did at that funeral. We're going to talk about that in depth. Would it have been a good idea if they had gotten rid of Mark Antony? Oh, so a good idea. You guys don't know Cicero well. But recruiting people who will give you an air of, of legitimacy, that's a good thing. I have nothing to say about swearing oaths or not swearing oaths. But Brutus doesn't make always the best decisions, but he's totally sure he is. No. No, don't ask Cicero. He never, he never joins anything unless he starts it. No. Yeah, like he said, oaths are for dirty, rotten scoundrels. Brutus... Are you part of a group or are you now the dictator of the group? You know how he's telling him what to do. I don't want Caesar telling everybody to do, but Brutus, I, Brutus, am going to tell everybody what to do in this little group. It's a little bit unnerving, yes. Oh, I'm so glad because we're just so dig into this. I botched this yesterday and I waited till the end and I didn't have time, so you guys are going to get it. It's the greatest part. Okay. So, so is, is this information anything we can use? Brutus is, I don't, you know what? Can I do this? I'm going to put a little question mark. I don't know what to do with this information. That Brutus is really bossy. And, and he, and he makes, some unwise decisions. I, I might see now I'm being you. Listen, I'm being you like I'm, I'm you writing ideas down. And this is me saying, okay, these ideas occur to me, but I don't know what to do with them yet. So I'm just going to file them away in a middle section and maybe, maybe they'll come up in handy. I don't know. Problem. What if Caesar doesn't want to go to the Senate? Like, what if his wife has a bad dream, which she does? And what if soothsayers keep telling you, beware the Ides of March, which they do? What if, what if he doesn't want to go? And now, there's a guy named Decius Brutus. He's not the Brutus, right? So he's the Decius one. He says, I got it. I'll make sure he gets there. I'll, I'll bring him. No worries. So he shows up, and indeed, don't go, Caesar, says Calpurnia. I had a bad dream. I had a dream that, that you were full of holes and your blood was spouting out like a fountain. That's a bad dream. And Desius is like, yeah, you got it all wrong. 
Caesar is the lifeblood of Rome. Caesar says, I like that. I like that. You notice how Caesar doesn't want to look weak ever. Weak or scared. So at that initial, at the Lupercalia, at the festival, he, he, he says, you know, I am Caesar. And he says, oh, would you come over here and talk in this ear because this one's a little deaf. Apparently you're not a god. You have a deaf ear. And he says, oh, I, I would, I could be scared of that if I weren't Caesar. But I'm Caesar. Yes, but I'm not scared. I think it was Cassius. It was when he said, you know, Jan Cassius hath a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. I don't want thinkers. Let me have men about me that are sleek and fat and lazy. Well, stab me to death, you know. Um, oh, those Cassius types. But I'm Caesar. I, I, I think he says something like, I tell you what ought what should be feared, not what I fear, for always I am Caesar. Well, yes. So when Decius comes to his house that morning and says, you got it all wrong, Calpurnia. Caesar's the lifeblood of Rome. And he's like, I like that. See, Calpurnia, you're a ditz. He's right and you're wrong. And they get him to go to the Senate. And throng him, stab him, and where does he fall down? The foot of Pompey's statue. Pompey is just looking over the body. It's wonderful. Uh, yeah, probably. Well, and I, you know, this is, Rhett, this is subject to poetic and artistic license. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I want to stop. Um, actually, let me mention something because I, it, I think that maybe we could add something else to our list. Um, do you remember that the soothsayer has a letter and he says, read it, Caesar, read it. it and, and he says, anything that concerns ourself will attend to last. We'll do public business first. That will be last. And it occurs to me that Caesar shows uh, signs of goodness. Can we just call them signs of goodness? Um, for example, refuses to uh, put personal over public business. And by the way, I didn't say this last week. But you may use anything that's historical from Dorothy Mills or from the play for your paper, all right? If Shakespeare took a little license with something, it's okay, we're gonna use that. Um, he, what did he, leave, what did he do in his will? Yeah, he left uh, a park and money to everyone, to, to citizens. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I, I don't know. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, before I talk about what happened at the funeral, does anyone else have something that you wrote down that you would like to share? Um, yeah, Brett. Okay, okay. Uh, Rome, 
the Roman Republic built on no kings. Does anybody else have something? Let's just freely. We're going to, by the way, as you finish the play this week, I would like you to keep working on this. All right. Other other things may come up. Yeah. And then, and then the next week we will write it. We only have three more weeks. So I may have to scan them. I was thinking about inviting you guys to my house for like a final one, if people can make it. But I can always scan your paper and, and send it back for people who can't. But unfortunately, my kids have two more weeks after you. Do you know what I mean? That I teach. So. No, because I'd really like to discuss the reasons. We might get more reasons. It's just a very chill couple of weeks. But you guys have done a lot. This, yeah, and then you'll bring it to me, and then I don't know if I'll have to, I don't know if that'll be the last week or not. But well, What? It's going to be a five, a, a normal five paragraph like we've been doing. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have another thing to share? Yes. Okay. I know. People didn't plan on that, and that's fine. If I need to get these papers back to you by email, you know, I can scan, I can correct them and scan them and send them to you, and I'll, I'll get them back to you. Don't worry about it. But okay, let's just, let's just stop. I'm sorry. We're just, okay, so we have three more weeks. Next week, we discuss, and you write. Oh, no, that'd be fine. And then I collect, and then the final week, I return. So it'll be perfect. I do have another writing assignment I wanted you guys to work on, but I might just either let it be optional for you. Um, we're, you were not going to have time to read the whole last book together, but The Eagle of the Ninth. OK, OK, back to this. Does anybody have another thing to share before we talk about the funeral? All right, I'm going to leave this up here in case something occurs to us, OK? Um, but keep adding to it, because remember another thing that that we can use when we think of ideas about a paper like this? What might happen and what did happen? Now, you already read in Dorothy Mills. Actually, we can just go ahead. Is Brutus going to win this? How's Brutus going to end up? Yeah. So so Brutus, let's just let's put it on here. Brutus dies. M many others die, including Cassius, which you know from Dorothy Mills, so I'm not ruining the play. Um, and, and it leads to more civil war. Because Mark Antony and Octavius are going to go at it. Okay, are we, is that cover it pretty good? You probably could write a paper from this, but let's keep Let's keep adding if we can. Mm. The driving force. This is true. And Mucius Skyvolus sure felt that way. He did not expect to come out of Lars Porcina's camp alive. I am on a suicide mission to kill Lars Porcina, and that's the way it is. And it must have been quite interesting to him that he made it out alive, except for the hand <laughs> that he stuck in the fire. But, but yes, he obviously thought, I'm taking out the enemy is worth more than my life. 
And, and maybe Brutus, and, and so maybe Rhett, are you saying that that could also be a yes, that the sacrifice is worth it, even if he knew beforehand that he was going to die? All right. That, that's a very good point. They, he was sitting in the Senate. They, they didn't expect it. And, and at this point, there's no Praetorian guard or anything. There's no emperor. There's just Caesar, and he happens to be dictator for life. So it would have been nice. But, you, OK. Um, uh, if I'm, Caesar trusted him. I mean, trusted him implicitly, right? So much so that he never, he never would think. He trusted all of them. He never would have thought that they would do this. He never, I mean, he had his suspicions about Cassius. But I don't think he ever thought it was going to go that far. Uh, they say, and, you know, this is in the play, uh, and it's not just Shakespeare's invention, that he defended himself with the only thing he had, a stylus. Uh, you know, the, the, the pointed stick that you scratch in a wax tablet with. And then he's lashing out with it until he sees Brutus. And when he sees Brutus is with him, he loses the will to live. And whether or not he ever said, et tu, Brute, and you, Brutus, you too, Brutus, the story is that he just basically threw his toga over his head, slunk to the ground, and gave up. If my good friend is in on this, I might as well just die. Which is very sad. Okay. The funeral. The funeral. Yes. I have heard this, that only one of the stab wounds was actually fatal. And of course, we would never be able to know who delivered it. When you have a mob of people stabbing you repeatedly, it's sort of like firing squad. You know, you never know who actually shot I mean, they could compare it to the guns, but probably, yeah. He was trying. He was trying to defend himself with his stylus. It wasn't going to work, but he was giving it his best shot. So he dies, and Mark Antony comes in. Mark Antony, who they left alive because Brutus said, "Don't kill him." He said, "He's like a limb. If you if you kill the body, the limb can't do anything." Mark Antony is just a limb. He's an arm. And once the body, once the head is off, not literally, but figuratively, um, it, the, the, the hand can't do anything. So leave Mark Antony alone. He's harmless. He's, he's an idiot, but he's harmless. Oh, yes, I've heard about this. I've seen some disgusting pictures. Um, so Mark Antony comes in, and of course he's scared. He does not know who's on the list of people who are going to die now. And they said, no, you're not. Nobody. Caesar had to go for the good of Rome. No one else. And then Brutus makes another really odd decision. Hang on, because I want to read it. No, it's not the funeral either. It's, okay, um... Hang on. Oh, why can't I find things when I want them? Okay, here it is. Stoop, Romans, stoop. And let us bathe our hands in Caesar's blood up to the elbows and besmear our swords. Then walk we forth even to the marketplace and waving our red weapons or our heads, let's all cry, peace, freedom, and liberty. Stoop then, 
and wash. How, how many ages hence shall this our lofty scene be acted over in states unborn and accents yet unknown, like English? Brutus in the English play says, oh, over the years, people in countries that don't even exist yet in languages we don't know, we're going to act out what we're doing right now. And it's kind of funny because the people saying those words are acting it out. Yeah, Brutus decides, let's just smear blood all the way up to our elbows and just cover ourselves in blood. Yeah. What? And scream peace and liberty. Yeah. That, okay. What? Yeah, and, and if I'm a common citizen of Rome and I see these guys come out of the Senate house and they're just covered in blood, because, okay, how are you not going to get it all over you? Do you know what I mean? Like, it's not just going to be their arms. It's going to be their bloody, waving their swords around. I am running home and locking the door. I am not listening to what they have to say. And I don't think they're the good guys. I don't know why Brutus said that was a good idea, Rhett. Well, no, I'm oh, no, I don't think, I don't, okay, let's put it in perspective. Rome, in the 50 years before this, has seen citizens slaughtered in the streets over and over. Sulla comes, Marius, Cinna, who we didn't talk too much about, but was in, in there with Marius and Sulla. Um, you know, the fear of when Caesar was coming, um, uh, the, the Crassus versus Pompey versus, we don't know. And for all we know, these guys are now going to go on a rampage and they're going to make the decision who needs to live and who needs to die. What? Yeah. Yeah. It, it would be horrifying. It, uh, so this does not seem like a good idea. Uh, from my perspective. But Mark Antony comes and he says, um, are you going to kill me? No. So can I have a funeral? Can I speak at the funeral? And Bruce says, sure. Cassius is like, Brutus. He says, you know not what you do. Do not consent that Antony speak in his funeral. Know you how much the people may be moved by what he will utter? <sighs> Brutus, who's always right. By your pardon, I will show myself to the pulpit first and show the reason of our Caesar's death. What Antony shall speak, I will protest he speaks by leave and by our permission, and that we are contented Caesar shall have all do rights and lawful ceremonies. It shall advantage us more than do us wrong. It will make us look good to let his friends speak at his funeral. Cassius says, I know not what may fall. I like it not. So here's the rules, Antony. You can't say anything bad about us. And you have to tell everyone we allowed you to speak. Those are the ground rules. And Antony says, you're on. And they leave him. And uh, messengers show up suddenly from Mark Antony and said, Hey, <clears throat> Octavius is just outside Rome. Now, historically, um, Octavius didn't show up right away. Octavius is Julius Caesar's grand nephew. Caesar's sister's grandson, okay? And he is Caesar's heir. Caesar doesn't have kids except with Cleopatra, and Rome wasn't going to accept that. And so um, he, he has no other heir, and, and Octavius is young. He's like 18, 19 years old. Smart. Yeah. Well, his, his family, he was in Greece at the time of Caesar's murder, and they said, don't go. You, you're, on, you're in the family, and you don't know if you're on the list. Like, nope, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go take care of Uncle Julius's stuff and collect my inheritance. I'm doing it. So he shows up. Mark Antony, in the play, sees this as an opportunity, and he says, tell, you know, tell Octavius to stay outside the city till I 
stir things up a bit because he already has a plan. And um, so they, they bring Caesar out. And now let's talk about this funeral because it's some amazing speech making. First of all, Brutus gets up. Brutus is very reasonable. Here's, here's Brutus's idea. If I just point out to everybody in a rational way the reasons why this needed to happen, everybody will be fine with it. Brutus forgot something. He forgot something that Aristotle taught. Aristotle said that when people make speech, or for us, we don't make a lot of speeches, so more writing, but back in, back in the ancient world, there was more speeches. There are three ways to move people. There are three ways to persuade people. One is by using reason. It's an appeal to logos. Logos is word, reason, rationality. It's when I give you reasons. Now, here are a list of reasons why you should, get, I don't know, eat vegetables rather than candy. You know, and then I give you statistics about your blood sugar levels and everything. I'm reasoning with you. <laughs> but that's not the only way we persuade people. Sometimes we persuade people by presenting ourselves as trustworthy. And then people listen to us. Brutus does this a little bit. You know, people trust Brutus, right? You know? And, and so when, when someone, uh, a doctor, when a doctor tells you, uh, you know, about his credentials and everything, about his studies of vegetables versus candy, you know, and, and so you, you believe him more because he seems to know what he's talking about. He seems like a good guy. But there's a third one. There's a third one, and it's very powerful. And Brutus didn't even think of it. It's appeal to emotion. Pathos. The first one's called logos, the second one's called ethos, and the third one's called pathos. Appeal to emotion. Stir up people's feelings, and you don't really have to reason with them. If the, you know, president of, I don't know, Hershey comes in and starts showing you Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory or something, like, he's no longer reasoning with you about whether or not you want to eat vegetables or chocolate. He's just working on your emotions. It's like, oh, I love this movie. Look at the river of chocolate. Let's go get a candy bar. I'm not thinking anymore. I'm just acting on emotion. Brutus only, Brutus relies on his ethos, right? I'm a good guy. You know, I'm a good guy. But he also relies on, I reason with him. So he says things like this. Um, if there be any in this assembly, any dear friend of Caesar's, to him I say that Brutus's love to Caesar was no less than his. If then that friend demand why Brutus rose against Caesar, this is my answer. Not that I loved Caesar less, but that I loved Rome more. Had you rather Caesar were living and die all slaves than that Caesar were dead and to live all freemen? As Caesar loved me, I weep for him. As he was fortunate, I rejoice at it. As he was valiant, I honor him. But as he was ambitious, I slew him. This is tears for his love, joy for his fortune, honor for his valor, and death for his ambition. Who, he goes and say, who here wants to be a slave? And if you want to be a slave, then you're the only one I've offended by doing this. Yes. Well, uh, a little bit, but I don't, I don't think the analogy holds so well because I feel like it's more like what Rhett was saying, that one person might be expendable, but the good of society might be worth more. I, I understand what you mean. And it does, I mean, obviously, he's saying, I'm partial to Rome rather than Caesar, flat out. But he's also insinuating, and so should you be, to his audience. We should all want freedom, liberty, 
more than we want Caesar, even if we love him. And then he just leaves. Okay, done. I've explained to you all. Now you're all on board with me. And you know what? As, as they pointed out, fickle crowd, they are at first. He says, now Mark Antony is going to get up and say a few words. I'm letting him talk. Stay here and listen to it. And as he gets up there, like, well, he better not say anything bad about Brutus. Go get him if he says anything bad about Brutus. And the question is, does he say something bad about Brutus? He doesn't. But have you ever heard the phrase that you follow the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law? He technically doesn't say anything bad about Brutus. But by the time he leaves, they are ready to rip Brutus to shreds. Well, it's just any sort of reasoning, like rat, rational. Yes, yes. Relying on your character, the character of the speaker. Yes. It is emotion. So the very, very famous, I'm going to read it again because I can. <laughs> and I challenge you all to memorize the part I'm going to read. It's an awesome thing to memorize. It's very fun to just belt it out at odd times to have it in your arsenal. Yeah, anytime. It's anytime is good. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often turned with their bones, so let it be with Caesar. Of course, he's now going to just turn around and praise Caesar. You know, he's, I come not to praise Caesar. Let the good he did be buried with him. But then he's going to go on and on about all the good. It's double speak. Do you know what I mean? He's saying one thing and doing another. The noble Brutus hath told you that Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault. And grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me, but Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Coffers are the banks. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal, I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which thrice he did refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and sure, he's an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke. But here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? Oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. Right, he's having a meltdown. A very, very well-timed meltdown. Yes. What would you say? I do. I do from the way he acts in the rest of the play. Okay, so he started out with reason, but twisted reason, right? So he gives you the reasons why you should love Caesar, but he's brought loot home to Rome. He's brought captives. He's, he's helped the poor. He's done all these things, and he's He's told, and, and Brutus is honorable, but he's doing it in such a way that he's using re twisted reason. But he's not going to stick with reason. What did he sink to there at the end? What's it going to do to the crowd when he breaks down and says, just give me a moment. i got to compose myself. I, my, my, my heart is there in the coffin with Caesar. He is not reasoning with them anymore. And he just completely blows away the reasoning. He comes back. 
starts speaking again. And uh, Gret said, here's a parchment. Oh, I got to read a little bit before that. He, let, he went home. Yeah, he said, I'm going to just leave now and let, no, he just left. He says, Mark Antony says, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, if I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius is wrong, who y'all know are honorable men, I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself too, than I will wrong such honorable men. But here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. Tis his will. Yeah, I found it in his closet. Yeah. Well, which doesn't mean it was really hidden. It just meant just it, among his papers. Tis, uh, let but the commons hear this testament, which, pardon me, I do not intend to read. Oh, he so intends to read it. I don't intend to read. And they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds and dip their napkins in his sacred blood. Yea, beg a hair of him for memory and dying, mention it, the hair, within their wills, bequeathing it a rich legacy under their issue. And of course, what's the crowd? Read the will, read the will, read the will. What's in the will? I want to read the will. Really? Really? D do you want me to read it? He is working them. He is playing them like a harp. Yes. I don't know that they did. He, he's saying you would if you knew how wonderful he was. Oh. Yeah, my husband told me about this. Yeah, I, I don't know, but but you got to remember when Shakespeare is writing, and maybe you don't know. Shakespeare is writing in the late 1500s and around the year 1600, and at this point, the England has broken from the church and set up their own church, um, but there's still, um, you know, a lingering... Um, remembrance of the past and it was always the the, the habit of, of Christians to have what we call them relics and so uh, pieces of hair of the saints or a tooth or bone or whatever but also things that belong to them um, and it, it, this comes from the fact that in the book of Acts the people took it said napkins from the apostles and just would lay it on sick people and, and they would be healed the, and, and so there is there is biblical precedent, in other words, for the fact that some someone who is just very in touch with God, very saintly, um, doesn't even have to go. That they can bring healing through their hanky um, and lay it on the sick person, and the sick person would get well. So I, and so it might be sort of like that. In other words, for for like a Shakespearean person listening to this, it would be Mark Antony saying you would treat him like you would treat the saints. Like you would treasure bits of him and his belongings like you would the saints. Even though even though um, uh, England wasn't Catholic anymore. I, I do not know of that. Um, we find out in the reading of the will that, I put up here, he left money to every citizen. He left his lands as a public park. You guys with me? I feel like I'm losing. I'm losing people around the edges. Um, and he leaves the the crowd threatening to mutiny, saying, "We'll burn the house of Brutus." Um, and they're so worked up. Okay, remember Antony said, uh, "If I read the will, but I'm not going to read the will. But but if I did, and they all they go nuts." We'll mutiny. We'll burn the house of Brutus. And they're going to run away. And, and Antony says, yet hear me, countrymen. Hear me speak. And they all yell, oh, peace. Here, Antony's speaking. Why, friends, you go to do you know not what. Wherein hath Caesar thus deserved your loves? Alas, you know not. 
I must tell you then, you forgot the will I told you of. He reminds them the will that I'm going to tend to read. It's like, hey, everybody, come back, come back before you go riot. You forgot something. Didn't read the will. And then, yeah, they, they grab, and this is historically accurate as far as we know. They, they grab benches, chairs, whatever in the forum, and just pack up and build a funeral pile right there, pyre right there, and just put Caesar on it. There's an impromptu funeral with anything they can burn. And head out, and the last scene you read, and this also, Shakespeare's source was Plutarch, the historian that we've read bits of, went out and found some poor guy named Cinna. And he just happened to have the same name as one of the conspirators, but he was a poet. He's like, I'm not. I'm sin of the poet. I'm sin of the poet. And they just murdered him in the street. Yeah, yeah, we don't care. You're a poet? Yeah, you're probably a bad poet. Kill you anyway. <laughs> That's very, very accurate. Very to the point, Rhett. Um, so... This is where the play left off. We're going to, because you already read what happened in Dorothy Mills, we're going to switch back and, and go through the rest of the Dorothy Mills. This is the rest of the play, though. Finish the play. Um, now, please know something. Shakespeare, in his historical plays, he likes to compress events. You know, things that take a year, make it sound like it took a week or something in his plays, because it just makes a better play, right? Then if you, you know, say one year later, come across the stage, when you, you know, that, you're not going to fill up that year. But it took, this didn't all happen immediately. There was apparently some rioting after Mark Antony spoke at the funeral. What he said, we don't know. Shakespeare has brilliantly given us a sample of what it could have been like and wrote one of the best speeches ever. But uh, but we don't know. But it wasn't, but Brutus and Cassius calmed things down. They did not have to leave immediately. And the wars that came after didn't happen immediately. This was within a year or 18 months, okay? But it's going to sound in the play like it happened, just lickety split, and, and which, is, which makes a better play. But it's not really history. Um, so Octavius comes in and... Uh, and Mark Antony just thinks he's kind of a joke. He's he's punk kid, you know. I don't know. We'll throw that in. He 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 wasn't very well respected in some circles. We'll put it that way. And Mark Antony thought Octavius was just easily manipulated, and it turned out he wasn't. And uh, so, but Cicero, Cicero hated Mark Antony. First of all, because he was a boozer and a womanizer. And just an all-around jerk. And Cicero gave some speeches. He wrote a bunch of speeches that he never gave, but he published them. Anti-Antony speeches. <laughs> and he's really mean in them, too. He just really insults his personal habits and everything. He's really mean. So because Antony hated Cicero and Cicero hated Antony, Octavius kind of buddied up to Cicero for a while. Like, maybe this guy will help me. But eventually, he kind of knew where the power was. And Octavius and Antony and a guy named Lepidus that, that we never talk about and we completely ignore because he just did nothing. I'm so sorry, Lepidus. You are the non-entity. Um, sorry, Lepidus. Um, but these guys formed another trio, another triumvirate, right? Just like Pompey, Caesar, and Crassus. And they said, we can run, we can run Rome. We can run Rome. Have you ever heard of a power vacuum? Do you know what I mean by there being a power vacuum? Someone powerful is, is gone suddenly, and it's just an empty space where this ruler once was, and people get sucked in, they want to take over. And Antony and Octavius and maybe Lepidus a little bit get sucked in. Lepidus, however, gets set aside very fast. They send him to Africa to take care of business, and they just ignore his existence. <laughs> so, so Octavius and Antony team up. 
And this is the problem. It leads to more civil war because Brutus and Cassius flee to Greece. And Antony and Octavius have an ax to grind against them. Octavius because they killed his uncle. And also it's probably not good to leave the murderers of the former ruler alive when you want to be the next ruler. Do you know what I mean? They'll come for you. And Antony was a good friend of Caesar. And Antony just wants to be in charge. Antony just wants power. Yes. I think so. I, I think so, because of what happens, because one of them does do that. I'm going to go ahead and, and go past the end of the play. Um, and, and really, you know, because one of you already told me that Brutus killed himself. I mean, you know how the play is going to end. You know what's going to happen. Um, but I just want to point out something to you guys before we talk about, go away from the play and talk about history. Do you notice that the play is only half over and it's called Julius Caesar, but Julius Caesar is now dead? And he's no longer a character in the play? When you read the Act 4 and 5, I want you to think about this. And I want you to ask yourself a question. Is Julius Caesar really just about Julius Caesar? Or is it really about someone else? Think about it, OK? What happened was Antony and Octavius went after Brutus and Cassius. And they met them at the Greek city of Philippi that the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to, the Philippians. And in a, in a couple of battles, took out their army. Brutus and Cassius ended up dead. Yeah, I mean, followers, people who thought they were great. People who thought, yes, Caesar needed to die. It wasn't that everybody, remember, Rhett, this mob rioting in Rome, they're the riffraff. But the thinking people, it's like, you know what? You're right. Caesar was bad news and dangerous, and we're going over with Brutus and Cassius. So they had, yes, they had, they had people on their side. Um, but that, when that was over, we have a problem again. Again, two guys. Who gets to be in charge? Oh, my gosh, it's going to happen all over again. It's been happening for almost 100 years at this point. So Octavius says here, Antony, you go east, and I'll do the west. We'll share it. Antony, why don't you marry my sister, Octavia, so we'll be family, and we'll just be happy, live happily ever after. Yeah. People did this. So, But Antony went east to take care of business. But the business he took uh, care of was not really what they had in mind. He hooked up with Cleopatra. Oh. That was his business. <laughs> Mother of his friend's child. So anyway, so he didn't start out that way. He ordered Cleopatra, Cleopatra, I order you to come to my presence and you know report to me. So she's like, got it. So she puts on all her makeup and perfume and fancy clothes and gets her prettiest ladies and decks out a barge with silk cushions and couches and stuff. And they're fanning her and it's, it's you know, and feeding her grapes, whatever. And she comes up the Nile on this barge. And Antony is standing there and he sees this vision, like a fantasy coming out of the desert, you know. And it's Cleopatra, and she says, hey, Antony, you know, I, hi. And he's gone. He's gone. He's done for. So he lives with Cleopatra. Oh, did I mention that he's still married to Octavian's sister? That's going to go over real well. Has three kids with Cleopatra. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they start plotting. Because remember how Cleopatra really, I'd really love to be queen of something other than Egypt, like Rome, like Caesar. That didn't work out. Maybe Mark Antony is my meal ticket, do you know? And so they start planning. They make little thrones. Listen, guys, they make little thrones for their kids. And it's so cute. Um, but it's not cute because he's, he's, he's acting like one of these Persian 
kings. He's no longer acting like a Roman. Cleopatra, everybody thinks she's bad news. Plus, he's completely dissing Octavius' sister. So Octavius finally, finally they have to fight. They're going to have to fight it out. Are you with me still? we got three minutes. They go to the west side of Greece. There's a town called Actium. And big sea battle. Cleopatra brings her fleet. Octavius brings his fleet. His right-hand man, Marcus Agrippa. He's a tough guy. He's good. And they fight it out. And then Cleopatra just sails away in the middle of the battle. What the heck? And Antony turns around. She's leaving. And so he just leaves. He just leaves. They forfeit. They forfeit the Battle of Actium and run home to Egypt. We do not know why she left. We still don't know. Why in the world did she just turn around and leave? Did she think the battle was going poorly? It was. Did she think she was in danger? She probably was. What did she think she was going to do? I don't know. And what did Antony think he was going to do? I don't know. But I'll tell you what they did. They went home and committed suicide. Um, Antony killed himself. I can't remember which one went first. I think it was Antony. Um, Cleopatra, yeah. Cleopatra was under guard. Octavius came and he's like, you know what you are? You will be a great exhibit in my triumph. I am putting you on a cart and wheeling you through Rome in a triumph. And Cleopatra thinks, well, it's not happening to me. If I can't go as queen, I'm not going. And so she was under guard. The story is, she had some maids with her that she had previously arranged with someone outside to bring, send in a, a bowl of fruit for her consumption. But hidden in the fruit was a poisonous Egyptian snake called an asp. And she took the snake and she just let it bite her. And then her maids did too. And so in a locked room, and they're like, how you doing in there? They find, they go in, dead bodies. That is the end of Cleopatra. Do you remember? I have two things to say. Do you remember when we read the Aeneid that Aeneas got a super shield made by the gods and with his armor, and the shield was all decorated? It was all decorated with scenes from the history of Rome. And in the middle, where you would put the super-duper important thing, do you remember what it was? It was, the, it was the Battle of Actium. It was this battle between Octavius and Antony. It was the Battle of Actium, the centerpiece. Because you know what? Antony's out. Octavius is in. Octavius is now going to be known as Augustus. Augustus, August, that word in English means revered, honored, yet powerful. So he's Augustus, and yes, named a month after himself, just like Julius named one after himself. And this, this man will be more powerful than Julius Caesar ever was. July, July, Julius, July. Um, Augustus is going to be the first Roman emperor. And we know when he lived, you read it in the book of Luke. In the days of Caesar Augustus, a decree went out to all the world that they should be taxed. So Mary and Joseph head to Bethlehem in the days of Augustus Caesar. This is what Octavius becomes. He is the last man standing. And one last comment. For weeks now, we've had Marius is on top, but Sulla's coming up, right? And then Sulla's on top, but Pompey and Crassus are coming up, and Caesar. And Caesar's on top, but then Antony and Octavius. When Augustus gets to the top, there's no coming behind. He's going to rule for decades, and he's going to be smart. He's not going to run around acting like a king and call himself dictator and all of this stuff, because that gets killed. He's going to go to the Senate and tell the Senate to ratify everything. He's going to be super careful, but he's going to set up the Roman Empire. And that empire is going to go on for another 400, almost 500 years. All right. Finish the play. Finish your list. Write down anything you can think of. Anything you get from um, 
in either reading, and we're going to read chapter 14 of Dorothy Mills and 15, part one. But it's in your reading guide, what pages to read. And I will see you next week. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. And thank you for visiting.